It's your son. What would you think of him? Yeah. I guess he looks like me. God, is he ever? He's a stamped out little miniature. You'd be afraid if I pick him up? Try it. I'm your dad. <laughs> He's a heavy little guy. What have you been feeding him? Oh, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. Octopus, blackbirds, anything. He's a traveling man, you know. Come on, you gotta see Aaron and meet everybody. My American husband, Byron Henry. Find a man. Somewhere else tonight. Good job. Good night. Thanks. Now there is a fine woman. Watching us. Oh, it's all right. It's only a year old. He's just curious as a raccoon. Oh, raccoon hell. I think he's taking notes. <laughs> that kid has got grown up eyes. Actually, honey, why don't I just put him back to bed, huh? Would you mind that? And then we can talk and, and I can get a little used to you. Sure. You know, you should be reassured, love. The procedure's obviously quite new to him. Does he really walk and talk? Clap when he does that. Ah. Well 
Well done, Sprout. Now, how about saying something? Hmm? <laughs> oh, you wouldn't understand him. It's all a jumble of Yiddish, Italian, French, and a little English. What about your father and Warren? Have you heard from them? Didn't the Red Cross forward my letters? I haven't had any letters since May. Warren's dead. He was killed in the Battle of Midway. Oh, my darling. He received the posthumous Navy Cross. Byron. Byron, I can't believe you. Listen, listen to me. The train for Lisbon leaves at midnight. You better start packing. Packing? You mean, you mean we're leaving now, tonight? Yeah. Now, Aaron will have to wait till the Consul General clears him, but I'm taking you and the baby with me. My God, Byron. Did the Consul General say you could? Not yet. We're going to his apartment now. Lieutenant, the Charge d'Affaires in Vichy has the exit visas. The telex came in today confirming that. We should be getting it any day now. Yes, sir. So you told me at dinner, but I don't see why I just don't take Natalie and the baby along now. I'm convinced I can get him on a plane with me back to the States. He's good at that sort of thing. No doubt, but the problem is Mrs. Henry's crossing the borders. Sir, my diplomatic passport cuts through immigration red tape like a hot knife through butter. You know that yourself. Not always. Suppose you run into a nasty French border inspector or a German agent. I'll have a story. I'd like to hear it. The baby got sick in Gibraltar. We rushed him to Marseille at night. Uh, we didn't bother with the visas. Look, I'll talk in broken French. I'll yell. I'll be the dumb American official. I'll make it stick. Unfortunately for your story, I've never seen a healthier looking baby. Mrs. Henry, are you willing to back up this story? Look, look, sir, once we're on the train, we'll have it rehearsed and down cold. Please don't worry. Lieutenant, I want to talk plainly to your wife. Go ahead. Mrs. Henry, as I said, there are Gestapo agents on the train and at the border, and they do exactly as they please. You may be pulled off the train. She won't be, and if she is, I'll go with her. And something else. Should this happen, it is entirely possible that your baby will be taken from you while you're questioned. That's how the Germans do things. And once you and the baby are in custody, I can't help you. We have a file of such cases pending now. People halted with questionable American documents. Some of them are already in reef salt. The concentration camp. You are trying to frighten her. I'm trying to be honest with her. Are you, young fellow? The risks are negligible. I'm willing to take them. It's not up to you. We're going to chance it. You are not. You are carrying top secret war documents. If you fail in your bluff, the Gestapo can arrest you and confiscate that pouch. I'm the senior American officer in this area. I'm warning you not to do this. I'm very sorry. Byron, it's only a few more days. Why take such a risk? Go, please, just wait for us in Lisbon. Damn it, Natalie. All hell's about to break loose in the Mediterranean. At the first sign of trouble, they'll close the borders. Good God, honey, we went from crack out of Warsaw in the middle of a war and you never turned a hair. We have Lewis now.
What do you think of him? Are you asking me? Yeah. I've been taking off that train to Lisbon by the Germans. I guess that's why you told me to come here first. Yes. Byron, she needs the exit visas. I know what you're feeling. But please, try not to worry. The visas will be here and everything will work out fine. I hope so. I'm sorry, I have to go now. luggage brought in. Now that she's here, she'd better remain until the visas come. In the morning, I'll send for Dr. Jastrow. As soon as they're ready, I'll escort them to the border myself. I'll have my driver take you to the train. Would you like some time alone with the family? Yeah, thanks. Terribly angry with me, aren't you? Well, not really. But I still think we could have made it. I'm sorry, Byron. I'm just too frightened for Lewis. I know. Honey, don't worry. I've got 30 days leave, and I'll just wait for you in Lisbon. I'll check with the embassy every day. I doubt I can book that honeymoon suite in Estoril. Try. I will. Well, I guess I better think about shoving off. November 3rd, 1942. A Grand Armada steams from the United States and the British Isles. 300 warships, 370 transports and support vessels, and over 100,000 troops. Destination, French North Africa. Originally scheduled for October 30th, the invasion has now been put back a week to the night of November 7th. 
when the combined forces will sweep ashore on the beaches of Algiers, Oran, and Casablanca. The new world, with all its power and might, sailing forth to the rescue of the old. cable from Churchill. Get me out. Any word from the Navy and the torch forces? They've got to keep radio silent, sir. No news is good news, I suppose. We'd be hearing plenty if the U-boats had attacked them. Uh, it's a miracle, Harry. The U-boats sank nearly a million tons last month, and yet that gigantic torch sails out undetected. But it's still five days from Africa. You know Eisenhower said that the decision on Torch may go down as the blackest day in history? Generals get paid to worry, Harry. <laughs> I've been reading Thucydides. Athens launched a sea expedition against Sicily very much like Torch, you know. It was a total disaster. And you know why? Because back home, political support fell apart. Which is why it's so damn important that the Democrats hold on to their majority in the House. Well, what does Winston have on his mind? Oh, first, Montgomery is definitely forcing Rommel back at El Alamein. We've been hearing that for two weeks. Two more thousand plane bombing raids are scheduled for November, Hamburg and Stuttgart. You win a war on the ground. And Churchill is very worried about Stalin's long silence. Well, I mean, the Stalingrad picture is grim, and Churchill's always been concerned about a separate peace in the East. You know, Lenin gave away half of Russia to the Germans in 1917 to make a separate peace. We have to hang on to Stalin. Mr. Hopkins, for you, London. Excuse me, Mr. President. Mr. President. Hello, Ed. What's the word from Democratic headquarters? Well, Senate's okay. Governorship's not so good, and they sure played hell with us in the House, all right. I don't like these off-year elections. How bad is it? They've gained the tops 47 seats. 47? Then they didn't make it. We've held the House by 11 seats. By thunder, I've got my Congress. Yes, sir. Not by much, but you still have your Congress. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'll tell him right now, of course. Thank you. Mr. President. That was General Allen Brook calling from Churchill's war room. The 8th Army has broken through at El Alamein. Rommel's forces are in full retreat. Well, splendid. You know what, Harry? I think we're going to rewrite Thucydides. <laughs> the sun hangs huge and red above the far dust-streaked horizon. The desert cold is already falling on Kidney Ridge. Here, not only did these German and British soldiers die who litter the ground, 
in the fading red light. Here at El Alamein, the Africa core died. The core was a legend, a dashing clean-cut enemy, a menace, and at the same time a sort of glory. In Churchillian rhetoric, a gallant foe, worthy of our steel. We have won here in the great western desert a victory to stand with Cressy, Agincourt, Blenheim, and Waterloo. Lines from Southey's Battle of Blenheim are haunting me here on Kidney Ridge. They say it was a shocking sight after the field was won. For many thousand bodies here lay rotting in the sun. But things like that, you know, must be after a famous victory. I am very tired. A voice that I don't want to listen to tells me that this is England's last triumph, that our military history ends here with a victory to stand with the greatest. If history is but the clash of arms, we leave the stage with honor. The sun going down on Kidney Ridge is setting on the British Empire, on which, so we learn to say as schoolboys, the sun never sets. I take a last look round at the dead of El Alamein and mutter a prayer for all these poor devils, German, British, who sang Lily Marlene in the cafes of Tobruk. again from Sunday. It was a very wicked thing, said little Wilhelmina. Nay, nay, my little girl, quoth he. Pamela Tudsbury. Oh, thank you, Colonel. Yes, he'll be very pleased. Good news. The interview with Monty is on. They're sending her jeep for us now. Us? Well, yes, I've been cleared too. Look impressed. Quite a landmark occasion for a female. Absolutely not. Out of the question. You're not going, Pamela. Of course I'm going. Of course you're not. But too dangerous. Dangerous? We're only going to his field headquarters miles from the front. I don't want to hear another word about it. Talky? Father? Pamela, go back inside.
I'm writing this in my hotel room in Cairo. As a World War I reserve officer, my father was buried with honors in the British military cemetery outside Alexandria. The London Observer asked me to complete the Kidney Ridge piece my father was working on when he was summoned to the Montgomery interview. I have tried, but I cannot. I can, however, complete Southey's verse for him. It was a famous victory. Professor, Mrs. Henry, here we are. Your exit visas, properly endorsed by the Vichy government, as promised. Superb. Mr. Gaither, I assure you my niece and I will be forever in your debt. Yes, I don't know how to thank you. It's not necessary, Mrs. Henry. And I've booked you both out to Barcelona tomorrow morning and then to Lisbon. I understand your husband's already arrived there. Yes, I'm to call him at the hotel when everything's arranged. By all means, use my phone. Professor, may I offer you a drink to celebrate? The greatest pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Gale. <clears throat> Natalie? Oh, honey, that's terrific. Yeah, tell Gaither I owe him one. All right, now listen. I'm trying to wangle some air priorities so we can get out of here in the next couple of days. You remember Bunky Thurston? Yes, of course, Leslie's friend of the embassy. Right, well, I found out today he's still here. I'm gonna go talk to him in the morning and see what he can do to help us. And honey, I called the hotel in Estro. I think I can get the honeymoon suite. Oh, Byron. Okay, tomorrow it is. And you better start teaching that kid of mine some American. <laughs> those convoys passing Gibraltar. The Fuhrer knows about it. He is not concerned. Yeah. But where are they heading for? Intelligence says maybe it's a landing in Sardinia. Well, the Fuhrer thinks it may be an attempt to put troops behind Rommel. Therefore, I have ordered a heavy concentration of defenses around Tripoli. Mussolini is quite sure that it will be French North Africa. Mussolini. <laughs> His judgment is clouded by two things, his ulcer and his whore. <laughs> Unbelievable. At most, a faint. Well, Yodel, I think you better show this to the Fuhrer immediately. You're the one who should tell him. As headquarters commander in chief. No, no, no. no. The Fuhrer is busy with his party speech. <laughs> is it worth disturbing him? He should be told immediately. Of course he must. On. Report this dispatch to the Führer. But uh, don't be alarmist or pessimistic. This is no big development. In all German history, our position has never been so powerful. Our new order rules all of Europe. My armies threaten the Volga, the Caucasus, and despite momentary setbacks, the Nile, and beyond. 
My U-boats have sunk almost 8 million tons this year. The Atlantic is becoming impassable to the enemy. As for Stalingrad... Monsieur, huh? we have an urgent submarine report. Large sections of those Gibraltar convoys have turned south. French North Africa, if it isn't a deception. One of our U-boats? No, mein Fuhrer. Italian. Italian intelligence. As about as reliable as Italian troops. Still, title is to telephone French Army headquarters in Vichy report this intelligence and tell them I demand a full war alert of all Admiral Darlan's land and sea forces in North Africa. To be fair, Monsieur. Meanwhile, we will proceed on to Munich until this little nonsense takes clearer shape. French North Africa. Knock Italy out of the war. Mm. The weak opponent. Not a bad move. If that's it. Roosevelt! Mm. Yeah. 7.46 p.m. Adolf Hitler addresses the party faithful on the 19th anniversary of his famous Deer Hall Putsch. Und wenn jemand fragt, wenn sie Stalingrad erobert haben, warum wird denn noch in den Straßen gekämpft? Antworte ich, das ist ein zweites Verdammt nicht lohnt. Es ist mir wohl egal, ob es ein, zwei oder drei Monate dauert, bis die letzten Rattenester ausgeräumt sind. Da wir in Stalingrad tausend Jahre bleiben werden. Ein Führer! Sieg! Heil! Sieg! Heil! Sieg! I regret to report absolute betrayal. British and Americans are waiting ashore, and Dallon has ordered ceasefire throughout French North Africa. Dallon! Our man! How could he suddenly turn so rotten? The treacherous swine! I understand that most forces there are obeying him, laying down their arms. Vichy apparently is impotent. Have Ribbentrop notify Mussolini and Laval. They have to come to Munich immediately. We confer tomorrow morning on the future of France. Yes, mein Führer. Title! Mein Führer. Prepare emergency plans for landing in Tunisia in force within 48 hours. The cowardly French won't fight Roosevelt's rival of green drafties. We will! So be fail, mein Führer. Also, alert the necessary units for the execution of a plan and top. Highest urgency, we occupy the rest of France. Yes, mein Führer. Best Panzers! I want my best Panzers thrown into Tunisia. The Deutschland, the Adolf Hitler live standarte. Yes, and the Hermann Goring Panzers too. That cowardly, bloodthirsty lunatic Roosevelt and his drunken lapdog Churchill have stepped into the quicksand. North Africa will be their political graveyard. And with Rommel taking over all command, he'll push Roosevelt's nigger troops back into the sea. And with those extra forces all across, we'll push him right back, this time to the Nile. Mein Führer, 
Visuals of Earl's greatest military genius leading us. This is bound to be a very positive development. Oh, yes. True turning point. what it says. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no. No. You guys got to deal with it, right? Byron Henry. Hey, Punky. What are you doing in Lisbon? Natalie and her uncle are coming in from Marseille today. Marseille? Yeah. Natalie? Yeah. I thought she was still in Siena. Well, a lot's happened since then. Listen, Bunk, I could really use a favor. I need air priorities for all of us on the next Pan Am out of here. Byron, nobody's coming in from Marseille today. Why not? What's going on? Haven't you heard? The Allies have invaded North Africa. What? The Fishi government's broken off relations with the United States. As of 5 a.m. this morning, the borders are closed. Gentlemen, I'm afraid I have some very serious news. I've just been informed that in violation of the armistice agreement, the German army this morning has crossed the borders to begin the occupation of Vichy, France. Furthermore, I was also informed that we are to be interned by the Vichy government. Please, let me finish. You are correct. Technically speaking, they have no right. Although they did break relations after the landings, we are not at war with Vichy France. As a practical matter, however, we will be taken by bus to Lourdes, where we will be confined along with other Americans from the occupied region until the Vichy government decides what to do with us. As most of you are aware, the usual drill in these circumstances is for the belligerent countries to exchange internees. Many Vichy personnel are still in our country, Vichy wants to be sure they'd be sent back safely. So there's no reason, I repeat, no reason to assume this situation is in any way different. We will be going home, and soon, of that I can assure you. All right, that's it. The buses will leave tomorrow morning promptly at eight. If anyone has a specific problem, Mr. Jones will be glad to talk to you. Professor Chastro, Mrs. Henry, may I see my office? I know how difficult these past few days have been for you, Mrs. Henry, for all of us, but I think Avram has some good news for a change. Is that true, Avram? Yes. I have documents for you, forged, but of excellent quality. I didn't tell you about this because I wasn't sure that Avram would be able to get them done up. It was very risky under the circumstances. Professor, these certify that you are now and have been for a number of years a credential correspondent for Life magazine. Well, I have written one or two pieces for them. And you, Mrs. Henry, are credentialed as Dr. Jastrow's editorial assistant. As journalists, you qualify as internees. But we're fugitives. How on earth could any document protect us if the Germans discover we're here? Fortunately for all of us, the Germans are rather busy these days. What with North Africa and Stalingrad. And our stay in Lourdes, as I told everybody, should be a brief one. But Mr. Gaither... Besides, there'll be almost 200 Americans in Lourdes. And we will undoubtedly be dealing with very low-grade Frenchmen and Germans. Not the kind of people that would be familiar with your reputation, Professor. Therefore, I believe these papers will suffice. Avram, isn't there anywhere else we could go? Back to the Mendelssohn's until we find a way out of here. But the Germans coming. Occupied France is no place for an alien Jew. 
It's just when I think of our names being on those lists and the Germans reading them. I should have gone with Byron. Oh, God, why didn't I go with him? Natalie. Natalie, your best chance now is with the Americans. This exchange will be made. What will you do? Play hide and seek with the Germans for a while. Then I go back into business. Remember, next year in Jerusalem. It was, of course, the most ghastly misfortune that we failed by only hours to leave Vichy France legally. En route to Lourdes, November the 12th, 1942. I write this entry as I sit on the bus with the other American internees. My only hope is that this pilgrimage town will hold for us the same miracles it supposedly has held for so many others down the years. Yet as my journey continues, I find myself thinking not of Lourdes, but strangely of a place of my youth, of Vietje. During our stay in the Mendelssohn apartment, we heard much grisly talk about the rumored atrocities in the East, mass shootings, gassings, death camps. And it was almost always the name of one place kept recurring never uttered except in hushed tones of the most profound horror and dread. My Osvietim. But now, in its ugly Germanization, Auschwitz. So, if these rumors are more than paranoid fears, the place where I studied as a boy, the place of so many fond childhood memories, may well be the center of the whole horror and the ultimate menace that could be facing us is transportation to the mysterious and frightful camp at Osvietim. That would indeed be a neat closing of the circle. My one consolation is that our random existence on this petty planet does not move in such artistic patterns. We are a continent away from Osvietim and only 30 miles from Spain. I still have faith that we will end by going home. He's formerly our charge in Vichy, now is responsible for all of us here at Lourdes. Pink, uh, Dr. Aaron Jastro, and his niece, Mrs. Natalie Henry. My pleasure, Professor. Mrs. Henry, why, that's our 
fine-looking young man you've got there. Thank you. Well, tell me, Mr. Tuck, what exactly can we expect? Well, I got the official word this morning. The uh, Vichy government does intend to swap us for their personnel in the United States. That's rather encouraging news, don't you think so, Natalie? Yes. Doctor, I'd like a moment with you, please. Oh. I must tell you in confidence that those Frenchmen in the United States mm -hmm. may elect to stay there rather than return to the gentle rule of the Hun. Well, that's rather alarming. But why tell me now? You're fairly senior among us, Doctor, in age and renowned. If you keep your spirits up, make no demands for actions at meetings that I can take, bear yourself cheerfully in tight moments. You'll be a quiet, strengthening influence when we may need it. Well, of course, I should be only too glad to be of any possible assistance that I can. Thank you very much, Doctor. Shall we go in? Settled in? Yes, fine. Everything all right, Professor? Fine, thank you. As a matter of fact, I'm finding this mountain air rather invigorating. How's the baby, Mrs. Henry? He's sound asleep already. <laughs> well, it was a tiring trip. Professor, this afternoon we'll be setting up our routine for the stay here. It would be helpful if you could uh, join me with some of the others and help organize. I'll be very glad to, of course. Good. Mr. Gaither? Who are those men? I'm afraid they're Gestapo, Mrs. Henry. They're being posted at all four hotels. What if they start examining our papers? They have no right to. And those documents will hold up. Professor, this is a roster of the rooms, uh, in case you want to get in touch with anybody. Thank you so much. I'll contact you later. On the Eastern Front, Adolf Hitler continues to feed whole armies into the meat grinder of Stalingrad's ruined streets. Meanwhile, Stalin grimly positions a million and a half fresh troops with masses of tanks and artillery north and south of the embattled city. Under the cover of a heavy blizzard in sub-zero weather, the Red Army attacks. Colonel General Kurt Seitzler, Hitler's replacement for Halder, the new chief of staff. This just came in. They must take it to the floor at once. Even so, Seitzler. I strongly advise that you do not disturb the Fuhrer at this time. It is long after midnight. He did not sleep well on the train from Berchtesgaden. The fate of the Sixth Army may be sealed in hours. Manstein and Goering will be here in the morning. There's plenty of time then to discuss all of this at the Situation Conference. Carter, I will see the Führer at once. I am Chief of Staff. The whole of my southern front in Russia is threatened with collapse. Very well. George. In Führer, bitte. Steady, Seitzler, you're new to the job. We've been through tougher ones than this on the Eastern Front. You'll prepare a full situation report tomorrow. Now, let us get some much needed rest. My Führer, this is extremely urgent. I must give General Paulus freedom of action now at once to fight his way out of Stalingrad to the west. Leave 
The Volga? You mean? Only if Paulus decides it is necessary, mein Führer, to save the Sixth Army. At least uh, let him plan a breakout. Where? The German soldier sets his foot. There he remains. I'm not leaving the Volga. Tell that to Paulus. Sure, it grieves me, but I must tell you this. The Sixth Army is almost encircled. 300,000 men, your most powerful mobile force, trapped. Nonsense! What is this nonsense? It's true, mein Führer. The Russians have torn open the Romanian front on the north and are closing with a pincer attack. You yourself assured me by telephone, not six hours ago, Zeisler, that the 48th Corps was closing that breach in the north. Mein Führer, I, I said they were counter-attacking. They, they fought hard, uh, very hard, but they were cut off and surrounded. Uh, overwhelming superior numbers. The whole Panzer Corps cut off by the Russians? Who commands that corps? General Ferdinand Heim, a very capable officer. You will order General Heim to report here to Rustenburg immediately. He will be court-martialed upon arrival and executed by firing squad. Oh, my fear, surely. Uh, an inquiry into the circumstances first. Gary will head the court-martial. He will, uh, he will choose his own court. To be fair, my viewer. Situation conference at 1000 hours. Yes. Tomorrow? Did you see him? You saw him. Then I don't have to leave the Volga. My Führer, I'd like to point out another advantage of this plan. Uh, there, there speaks the conqueror of Sevastopol. Army group done will drive up from the southwest with powerful fresh forces to relieve Paulus. Meantime, 6th Army should form a hedgehog at Stalingrad. Field Marshal Erich von Manstein, mastermind of the conquest of France, Germany's most brilliant and successful professional officer. That may be possible. But of course, all this absolutely depends on keeping the 6th Army supplied by air until my relief columns break through four to six weeks. No problem. Right, Marshal, with all respect. And I lift to 500 tons a day in this weather. And with the Luftwaffe already tied up in supplying Tunisia. Mein Führer, supply by air to Paula's army is a matter of life and death. Mein Führer, I will supply the 6th Army at Stalingrad. Then, it is all decided. The Sixth Army will hedgehog where it stands. General Paulus' command will henceforth be known as Fortress Stalingrad. The relief of Fortress Stalingrad will be the mission of Army Group Don under Feld Marshal von Manstein. I will supply the necessary fresh, powerful forces. Stalingrad. 
Göring's airlift is nothing but empty talk. It's hopeless. He simply says whatever the Führer wishes to hear. In only six of the Nazi concentration camps sold in the Polish backcountry, does the SS murder Jews in mass upon arrival with an elaborate hygienic hoax of disinfection. The German names for these places are Chelno, Belzec, Sobibor, Treblinka, Maidenek, and Auschwitz. But Auschwitz is in a class by itself at once the biggest asphyxiation center, the biggest corpse robbing center, and the biggest slave factory center in all of German ruled Europe. Of course you can't see it now, but in the spring, all of this grass and flowers. Our chief engineer, Herr Prüfer. Herr Standartenführer Blobel. Herr Littler, Standartenführer. Herr Prüfer is with Topf and Sun, Erfurt. Yeah, yeah, I know the firm. <coughs> when do we fire? We'll start the blowers in an hour. Ignition shortly thereafter. I think ready for your approval over Sturm and Führer. How many will this hold? Two, three thousand? Yes. Two hundred and ten square meters. And the other three installations? Approximately the same. Depending on the special requirements on a 24-hour basis, you could conceivably possess as many as uh, 60,000. The escape. It's on. When? Tomorrow night. Come. The cyclone B caps dropped in from above. And the gas comes out through this wire netting. Efficient. Examination and collection. Gold teeth, hair. Once finished in the other room, the disposables are taken here and inserted for combustion. Adults two or three at a time, children four or five. Three-stage furnaces, stage one, powerful electric motors, force air to stage two. Lumber and waste oil create such superheat that the disposables in stage three in burning 
return to fuel themselves and speed up the combustion time by a factor of three. The capacity? Theoretically, in a 24-hour period, 3,000. And in all four facilities, between eight or 9,000. <laughs> Your chimney linings won't take such heat. Special, super-tested ceramic bricks. We guarantee the linings. Well, I do things differently. More simply, but... Uh... <laughs> Lose, lose, up, land. Tuck, tuck. In actuality, the highest daily number ever to be gassed and cremated will occur in 1944, during the extermination of the Hungarian Jews. In one day, 24,000 men, women, and children. Fine engineer, civilian idiot, in his nice, comfortable tweed overcoat and English shoes. One month behind in delivery. Test postponed twice, but he needs a few months in Auschwitz. Straight to the political block, the dirty swine. Not flame cause. So inefficient, so wasteful. As to not the result of this Pittsburgh duck in the 1940s, those old rotten bodies just won't burn away. Yet the orders from Berlin are to eradicate. Eradicate all traces of mass graves. My dear Commandant, that is exactly what my commando 1005 is doing all over Poland and Russia. Let me give you some tips. Thank you, Sir Nattenfuhrer. You're a gentleman, a man of culture. Not like those damn paper pushers from Berlin. I am an architect by profession. Well, let me at least give you a good dinner. Dinner? Maybe a little drop first. I thought you would never say it. <laughs> <laughs> My compliments, Bauhaus. The finest wine. The best food I have eaten since before the war. Such a distinguished guest. Oh, what a lovely cake. Inge, yes, auch essen, ja? Hannah is a wonderful cook, too. You like chocolate cake, eh, Hans? Yeah? Yeah. Special treat. He got an A in German today. An A? That's very good. What for? <laughs> Sir, for reciting Schiller's poem, Die Glocke. Of all times. Well, 
Why don't we all eat our dessert? This has been a, a continual problem, hasn't it, Rudy? Reichsführer Himmler has mentioned it on a number of occasions. Take turns hosing him up. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul, I wish you could see what we do with these escaped prisoners when we bring them back. We dress them up in an old clown suit or hang a sign on them. Hurrah! I am back! Discipline. Hagen Hag. I still can't get over it. Such luxury. Twenty more where that comes from, Paul. You should see what these Jews bring in with them. And uh, as a gift from me to you, a case along with some decent brandy and a few boxes of Havana cigars will be delivered to your airplane. Fine, Rudy, fine. 
Thank you. Now sit down. Let's talk business. Auschwitz is supposed to supply my commando 1005 with workers. Correct? Yes, of course. Well, you have been sending me rubbish! They don't last three weeks. I need strong men. 500 able-bodied Jews in the next shipment, Rudy. 500. Over the Reichs, Führer and I will have to have another little talk. The crematorium. What about it? The guys who built it. The Klinger gang. Best fellows I've got. Four or five hundred of them. You, for immediate liquidation. You can get four, five solid months' work out of those guys before I get rid of them. Will that do? Fine, Rudy. That will be fine. Excellent. Hague and Hague. postponed sentence of death. The guy in the labor section told me escapes are easier from 10.05. Yeah. You got the film? Yeah. The address in Prague? God be with us. Amen. The battle for Guadalcanal is in its fourth bloody month, and while the toll has been heavy on both sides, the United States is gradually gaining the upper hand. The Japanese have lost over 20,000 of their best troops, 500 aircraft, 15 warships, and large numbers of transports and troop carriers. The United States, 2,000 dead or missing, 300 aircraft, 20 combat vessels, including the fleet carriers, Hornet and Wasp. And like the Japanese, many more transports and troop ships. So many ships of both sides have been sunk that the Marines dug in on the island, called the waters off Guadalcanal, Iron Bottom Sound. And the end is not yet in sight. We're zeroing in now, Captain. Our salvos are bracketing them. November 30th, 1942. American naval intelligence has learned that the Tokyo Express is steaming again. This time, a force of heavily escorted Japanese transports to reinforce with fresh troops. 
their starved, sick, doomed garrison ashore off Tassafaranga Point. And Admiral Halsey has ordered Task Force 67, five cruisers, six destroyers, to intercept and destroy. Relatively new to the South Pacific, Admiral Wright, Task Force Commander, ignores hard information that the Japanese carry an engineering marvel, the Long Lance Torpedo, capable of striking with deadly accuracy at 20,000 yards. He has closed to well within that range before opening fire. Caught by surprise, the Japanese have but one option, a desperation murderous shotgun blast of long lance torpedoes. And within minutes, Tassafaranga turns into one of the worst disasters the American Navy will experience in the course of World War II. says he thinks his group can make Tulagi. They're all still making steam. We're affecting repairs or trying to as we go. We'll head for Tulagi too. That's one hell of a fire. You got a concern there. Yes, sir, we're fighting it. 
You require assistance. No, Admiral. The radar shows these bandits retiring westward. I'll uh, sweep around Savo Island with my destroyers and engage them beyond torpedo range. Now listen, Bugs. If you need any help, you can holler. I'll send you over a couple of my small boys. Aye, sir. Good hunting. It's been one hell of a night. Yes, sir, it has. Good luck, Pug. Thank you, sir. Sir. We better lie too, sir. Lie too? I just got her on course. If we can keep her afloat till dawn, we might make Tulagi right behind the rest of them. The shoring is giving way on the fourth and fifth decks, sir. Now what do we do, Jim? Just let her drift, filling up with seawater? I'll take some turns off the engines. With any way on it all, we won't hold out the sea. Captain! The loop supply to number four engine is failing. Pumps can't overcome the list. The bearings are burning out. I see. Maybe I will ask the Admiral for a couple of destroyers. I guess you should, sir. I'm going below with Chief Clark and see for myself. You get on the horn and ask Griffin for those destroyers. Tell him we're a fire, dead in the water, listing 18 degrees and down hard by the stern. Aye, aye, sir. Griffin? Griffin, this is Hawkeye, over. Stories are on their way, Captain. Very well, sir. Prepare to abandon the ship. Sir. We've done everything we can, Jim. She's not making it. Now we better start getting the wounded off. Aye, aye, sir. Now hear this. All hands. Prepare to abandon the ship. Repeat. ship stations. The count is taken of killed, missing, wounded. The roster is complete. As 
as complete as it can be, sir. Okay, Jim. Abandon ship. Aye, aye, sir. Abandon ship! Abandon ship! Pass the word forward! Abandon ship! Sir? No. Well, I'm not going down with her, if that's what you think. I wouldn't be much good with the war effort under 400 fathoms. I rounded up a gang of volunteers under Chief Clark. If we can keep her afloat till dawn, we might be able to get a tow line on I'd like to volunteer for that duty, sir. Some of the bunks are still working now. If I could counter flood, I might be able to... Negative, Commander Gregg. You're needed in the boats. Aye, okay, sir. What was that last count? 54, Captain. Dead, or missing, 217. You sure hauled ass, like the Honolulu, no, sir. No, sir. You couldn't have done anything else, Captain. You couldn't let the bastards get off scot-free. On your way, Jim. I'll miss the North Maru, sir. Jim, you take the battle answer. Quiet on your next command. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Over the side with you. Destroyers have started fishing our men out of the water now, sir. Yeah. Chief, she could capsize any minute. I'm afraid you're right, sir. Let's abandon ship. Aye, aye, sir. Come on, dog, sir! Let's go! Abandon ship! Move it. Abandon ship! Over the side now. Captain, get moving, Chief. You're here in the boss, man! Let's go! Over the side! Cast off. Aye, aye, sir. Cast off. Captain.
Looks like he's starting to go. Johnson, slide two. 